They called him the Video Mercenary, gaming soldier of fortune. He played RPGs, ARPGs, JRPGs, SRPGs, CRPGs, and many more. His channel began in 2016. This expository segment's been cut because it adds nothing to the video. Metal Gear is fun. It's a game where you run around and choke a guy. Some other stuff. You know, when you think about where Metal Gear started and where it is today, a whole line of sequels, a library of spin-offs, a series that lived through every era. It's hard to know where to start. Metal Gear's got a lot going on. Up front, it's a modern military glaze stealth experience. From behind, Metal Gear Ass Joe. From behind, it's interested in topics like fate, war, society, real headline words, and for video games, starting as early as 87, it's refreshing. But that doesn't mean it can't be the campiest, most tonally demented, scatological piss take on cinematic gaming you'll ever see. And we're here to record the rise. Today, we're looking at the modern Metal Gear series. Default difficulty, mainline games only. Yeah, I know about all that NES business, okay? But we're on a schedule. A new fan's not likely to head that far far back, and frankly, the series didn't have massive cultural penetration until the Metal Gear Solid landmark. You could say Solid informs the rest of the series. Also, I know like 99% of you know who Hideo Kojima is, you know, creator of the Metal Gear series, the closest thing to an auteur in gaming, perennial piss lover, and we'll do a little inquiry into his place in the series when it's relevant. Right, kept you waiting, huh? Let's go. Metal Gear Solid's a lot of butts. Stop. Stop. The level of detail is mind-blowing for the PS1. Guards will notice your footprints and investigate. But only one guard in the game on this tiny snow patch realistically will. The stealth gameplay is engaging and open-ended. But you can count the number of stealth sandbox rooms on one hand. The story's just like an action movie, and its use of characters, reveals, and twists is enjoyable as a viewer and player. Except the dialogue is fluffed to the moon and the phone keeps f ringing. God, just quit with the phone! I have enough trouble calling the dentist! That little pro-con list isn't a shot at the game, not really. Metal Gear Solid reminds me of Devil May Cry, the original. You know, it's an incomplete vision, a functional microcosm of the imagination contained within, but it's still a great play. The famous cinematic intro with credits set the mood, some light sneaking and you're there. Shadow Moses Island. The base a metallic gray toned with purple, highlighted with yellow and teal, set amidst a barren snowscape. The PS1's a surprising console, the devs were absolute wizards, and MGS manages to sell the military aesthetic as near otherworldly. Fitting considering the events. Just don't look at that guard, please. Nothing happened. Metal Gear is a fun little game in its primitive state. The radar is packing more info than you need. It's simple and clean. You walk into rooms, assess the situation, and game over about five times per. But that's the gameplay. It's all about stealth. I mean, combat's no good. Look at that little bar. You call that health? What you at, three packs a day, son? You haven't read the Surgeon General's warning, have you? What's really fascinating is the number of options eventually given to the player and how totally irrelevant the bulk of them are to completion. Now it's fun to figure out the AI, see what makes them tick, Hey, why you peeing, bro? But every Metal Gear entry suffers in the early game from minimal options. I mean, you're barely armed, your health is low, you're not up and up on the mechanics, so you fumble around with the controls, but more importantly with the levels themselves. The game is very small, but cutscene and boss counts are very high. It'd be like a frequent serotonin dribble. You know, gee, I finally beat that section and now there's a cool cutscene. Unfortunately, the script's novella length, so during each cutscene, Kojima manifests in front of me playing Airplane with a tablet of serotonin like a loaf of bread on a spoon, relentlessly reporting the history of serotonin as he inches closer. Did you know serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine is a monoamine back. neurotransmitter? It was originally discovered oh by Italian pharmacologist oh Ettorio Erspamer, but it was not formally known as serotonin until 1948 when the chemical was oh, discovered by a pair anymore. of American scientists. Serotonin, aside from regulating mood, no. additionally assists in no. bowel function. In case you're not familiar, I just described the functional content content of 80% of Metal Gear dialogue. Just in general. That's no dunk on the localization, by the way. I understand many lines were adapted for a Western audience, and it comes across as surprisingly believable. It's just that they fill so much air with so many nouns, it's kind of suffocating. But the cutscenes aren't all fluff. The series might appear cold, even bland, but it's bubbling with personality and intrigue and even a number of relatable characters. You care about Snake. He's the most down-to-earth, aloof super soldier you'll find in games. You care about Otacon because he's your foil, a dork who loves and loses more than once 
Robinson, the proper ally in a world of hidden motives. You care about Meryl because she's a rookie, because the lingering question, will she get out alive, pulls you to act. That's just on-screen allies. There's a pile of Kodak conversations to farm if you care to take yourself out of the gameplay and listen, though for me, the game's events felt too time sensitive for casual conversation. I guess that speaks to its overall plot construction, but we're neglecting the enemies. The bosses are fairly hit or miss, but they're built with purpose, so from the top, there's the co-op skirmish with Meryl that establishes her rookie behavior, being unable to shoot during the first round. There's Revolver Ocelot with the only proper gunfight in the game. There's the tank that requires grenades, reminding the player to experiment with other tools, because at that point you're mostly ghosting through. There's Grey Fox who tests your melee. Real quick sidebar, by the way, loved. Loved trying to play this like a fighter. Do a little bait and punish. <laughs> So I gave up and bum rushed him to death. Better block B. Psycho Mantis is everybody's favorite combat puzzle that probably isn't as intuitive as everybody members, but to be fair, the online populace saturated the web with that particular knowledge. Shoot, even the colonel tells you what to do. Gives you an alternative if you can't plug your controller into another slot. Aside from these early fights, the only real standout down the line is Vulcan Raven, because his fight almost exclusively focuses on stealth and gear. Starts slow and tricksy, turns into a mad scramble for survival. It's engaging in a way that no other fight really is, because most of them focus on using one specific weapon instead of all the explosives Snake shoved up his ass. I wouldn't criticize that normally, but several fights are accompanied by bizarre narrative moments that sometimes end up justified by the game's development constraints. Okay, listen. Weird story bit the first. Meryl gets blasted. Wow, that's violent! And instead of fighting, Snake's forced to backtrack to one of a couple locations with a sniper that was previously inaccessible. It isn't even that much of a problem if you know where to look, but the whole time you're thinking, wow, Meryl's f dead. Because she just took a series of light speed slugs through the body and I didn't see any band-aids lying around. It just cuts the narrative tension without a payload, you know, just limply flutters to the floor. Sad. Weird story bit the second. Liquid tries to kill you with a helicopter, but you make him explode, only for the guy to waltz back into the plot unscathed and say he was luring you through the facility the entire time. No. Weird story bit the third. Otacon's question. In general? The actors sell the lines, but I don't buy it for a nanosecond. The cutscene took me totally by surprise, because it felt bizarre, like Omega Soldier Solid Snake gives heartfelt speech about love after being asked by nerdy acquaintance. This mission is time sensitive. America is currently threatened by nuclear action. Imagine this scene performed with fake British accents. Oi Snake, do you think love can bloom even on a blooming battlefield? Weird story bit the final. I have no idea how I'm supposed to feel during cutscenes, especially with bosses. Like every member of Foxhound, this group of elite super soldiers, right, gets capped one by one and each launch immediately into a teary monologue about their life. Like I care! Dude, Mantis did a creepy thing with Meryl and tried to make her adult herself. I don't care if you're ideating about being good now. Act haughty, get shoddy. <laughs> Sniper Wolf's even stranger. I think I'm supposed to like her because Otacon fell in love with her and everyone else likes her, but she tried to shoot me, definitely shot Meryl, and tried to shoot me again. That's most of her screen time, so uh, act violent, get silent. Maybe I'm complaining too much about the plot, I just don't see a ton of value in the thing. Like, for an action film, if they cut the fluff, It'd be a fun movie. There's a lot of interesting character moments and the overarching narrative bit about genetics, autonomy, and fate. It's a meatier narrative than any action movie variant could produce. But the game delivers its story fairly poorly with endless text, overlong cutscenes, general nonsense. I got all of the <laughs> Liquid. That isn't how that works! Ultimately, it succeeds at making the player care. For me, it was Meryl and the torture scene. Yeah, I hope you like this, you bastard. Shut up! It's an infamous scene, you have to mash or Meryl dies. I hadn't saved in a while. My one hand flares up a bit if I mash too hard, especially in moments like this. And at this time, I didn't know the spoon trick. Couldn't mash with my other finger. I was livid I couldn't actually save a character I thought I didn't care about because of my personal weakness. I mean, keeping Meryl safe's one of the driving tensions in the early game. I feel like between Otacon, Ocelot, Meryl, Sniper Wolf, Grey Fox, this game does so well with characters. You're gonna have something pulling you forward. And really, that's the genius of this 
particular game. It's obsessively detailed, from puddle sounds to sneezing guards losing vision for a sec. There's this wealth of small features added to what is, effectively, a two to three hour game. Characters don't do a lot, but when you see them, they're getting their moment, whether that's a sweet battle, a five minute cutscene, or both. It tends to break its own flow up with unnecessary backtracking through old areas, especially near the end of the game with the card key, but the joke's already on the player. They're in too deep to quit now, and those assets weren't easy to make or fit in. And you've been through all those levels enough times to get intimate, like I mentioned before, with the early game fumbling. It even makes use of the PlayStation hardware and the back of the box from Merrill's Kodak. The team asked, where do we start? And Kojima really said, everywhere. This stuff is important. Make use of everything. Let nothing go to waste. Pump enough camp into the cast so it's not perceived as generic. Drop a few twists. You've got an experience people will never forget. Because whatever got them wasn't enough, and they want more. Even funnier when you consider that Kojima apparently didn't try to make the game sell. Didn't even care. Knew it was done for. Seven million copies down the line! Ah, twin snakes. You know the meme about Twitter artists posting an updated version of an official character design with some crap like, fixed it, I can literally hear the tilde key being ground into dust. Okay, that's not fair. The designers weren't arrogant about the project or anything, but they did make two human. Uh... That's a whole story and a half, but Twin Snakes came out because Nintendo wanted a Metal Gear title on the GameCube. MGS2 was already out and doing great, so the idea was pull the mechanical updates over without generally considering the impact on the integrity of the experience. Welcome to How to piss everybody off without really trying. On its face, it's MGS1, but updated, smoother, smooth brainer, and really, it's not awful. It's still got the bones of one with the mechanics of two. It's still functional, and if you play this game like I did, like a feckless savage, it's fairly comparable to the original. At first I thought, shucks, why is everyone so mad? Looks fine to me. I like the funny cutscenes in theory because I don't take this story incredibly seriously. So it turns out I'm <laughs> stupid. Setting aside that first person mode with any silenced gun turns the the game into a snooze fest. Setting aside that the tranquilizer mucks up the entire narrative thread about Snake enjoying his, uh, wet work, almost every mechanical difference has terrible ramifications for the game. Don't give me the radar with vision cones if they're not accurate. Those guys see twice as far now. Show it or take it away. Guards have enhanced AI, which I assure you was enjoyable to break in. I especially like how they'll hear you running on the catwalk and run all the way up to investigate. Wasn't prepared for that. Thankfully, the newly ported hanging mechanic means I can ignore this stealth skill check room with some adequately timed acrobatics. Now that's quality gaming, boy. Other people have broken this stuff down better because when you really dig into it, it gets gross. But what really did me in was the cutscenes. You know, all I heard was, but my dark tone, they ruined my series pee pee diapy game. <laughs> Except they did. You know, I can't afford captions for my videos. So uh, to describe, Snake faced down a tank and pitched a grenade perfectly down the barrel, like... Oh, it's a crow siesta. They swallowed the bones. I don't think MGS was some incredibly dark game, or rather, I think it was comfortable laughing at itself when it mattered, but it did a lot with atmosphere, music, and player disempowerment early on. So when Snake evades tank fire like an action hero, you get the sense he really almost died. Twin Snake's Snake could literally fold every guard up like a balloon animal if he wanted to. He's portrayed like a genuine superhuman. He should be back flipping through every level, chopping dudes' heads off with his flailing razor schlong, given his cutscene performances. And damn, look at Otacon. Looks like a Dishonored character. Oof. Now, I never got super invested in him, but he had a place. And yeah, notching him down from dorky human to bumbling f uh. eighth width kind of sucks. He wasn't a joke character in the first, and it looks like he's been misconstrued as one. That's the gist of this story. The game might fit more cleanly with whatever Metal Gear turned into, but even if that's true, Snake does nothing this flamboyant in any other game. It's the other wacky cast members with their conceptual work rooted in the original Foxhound crew that pull this Shonen Jump stuff, you know? Leave the guy alone. Let him smoke in peace. And it's not like Twin Snakes never did anything. It took away the card key backtrack segment if you know where to look, and, uh, and, uh, uh. You know, the early game's biggest problems weren't really gameplay related. It was, instead, constantly info-dumping about military gear, 
past military operations, and for all that environmental detail work, they don't really lean heavily on environmental storytelling, but they do lean heavily into exposition. For example, here's the background to one. Solid Snake is the twin brother of Liquid Snake, both genetic clones of Big Boss, created in the Les Enfants Terribles project using the super baby method by the shadowy organization known as the Patriots, which is also known as the Lolly Lule Lo, unironically. Furthermore, might as well cut right there. The second game doesn't actually fix that, but so what? Metal Gear Solid 2. Now that's a game. Disregarding Twin Snakes, the early MGS games followed what felt like a really clear rise in quality. Which is crazy because fans hated this game, or at least hated what they were being sold initially. It wasn't the mechanical additions, mind you. That stuff's great. First person aiming, a ranged non-lethal option in the trank gun, smoother interactions with the environment, and tighter controls. The player was buffed in significant ways. I guess it was the opening mission, huh? And you know, marketing misdirection. So the the game's broken up into two segments, the tanker and the plant. The tanker's a big tutorial, it's dark and tinged teal, it's just like Shadow Moses. And yeah, it's a bit of a slog learning the new mechanics, especially the new AI. Nothing happened. But it gives you all the skills and callbacks to the first game you'll ever need. Not so young anymore, eh, Snake? Dang, imagine your arm gets cut off and they infect you with British. The tanker ends quickly enough and you're shuffled into a suspiciously familiar scene. I think players assumed all the MGS1 imagery was supposed to ease the impact of hard swapping to the newly playable Raiden character. Enormous lol. Yes, Raiden, the character created to sell potential women buyers on Metal Gear. Look, I get the smooth boy concept, but you're giving up a pound of beef for it. No wonder MGS fans hated Raiden. Flashback to Snake, you got this hyper-competent, weirdly positive veteran. By comparison, the Colonel and Raiden get along like... You're needed on Strut C. No. Collect as much data as you can. No. Rescue the President. No. I need scissors. No. <laughs> Is this what you think of me, Kojima? Because Raiden's much more of a player insert than Snake. He's the pure result of the military's VR training super soldier initiative. All that stuff you were supposed to do in the first game. Snake was the action hero, inherently capable. It's in his genes. Raiden hasn't got a shred of experience outside of the virtual world, and given the dialogue between him and Pliskin, yeah, okay, whatever you want to call yourself, bud. It's clear that there's a threat of suspicion for technology and even gaming underpinning the narrative. Anyway, obstinate pretty boy snoot or not, the level design and mechanics experienced in Harmony make for a surprisingly enjoyable, sometimes relaxing game. Especially in the early sections, it's why I had so much fun. Once the tutorial's done and you've got some skills under your belt, yeah! Oh, shit. You're set loose in the large first half of the plant, a zone with several open-ended stealth sandbox rooms and a scavenger hunt objective. It's such a perfect choice, a natural extension of the older linear play that invites player input rather than demanding it. If anything, I wish they opened with this, or something like it, because it's infinitely more forgiving and free than the actual tutorial level. I'm especially into the various mini-objectives you're handed, doing investigative work, long and surprisingly interesting pseudo-platforming sections, carefully diffusing a bomb-rigged bridge. Uh-oh. Even the water level, the nail-biting Emma backtrack bit, and the sniper cover segment were all fun mix-ups on Metal Gear gameplay. Unfortunately, the stealth play kind of gives way to these, but they're still stealth-based, and unique challenges that don't ask too much of the player, just that they keep a sharp eye on things. <laughs> MGS2's aesthetic elements are uniquely interesting when comparing the games. In fact, it's like they picked a major color for the initial three and ran with it. Orange is Blue's complement, it contrasts well with the darker tone of the original, and even thematically signals a sort of coming into the light for the series. Most of the game takes place in well-lit rooms and direct sunlight, too. And so have the horrific Kojima fever dream characters. Don't get me wrong, Psycho Mantis was wild, but now we're dealing with a real-life Romanian blood-hungering bisexual vampire named Vamp. Vamp. Or how about Fortune, who redirects all bullets in her vicinity and has a large gun? This is suspiciously normal for Kojima. Let me look it up real quick. Oh, no. Fortune was originally intended to be a saxophone player herself and would play the sax during cutscenes throughout the game. She was also to have suffered from a blood disease for which Vamp would regularly suck out her blood as a form of treatment in an erotic fashion. <laughs> Additionally, Fortune was to carry Chinese fortune cookies around with her, and would read them during combat, with each one saying, You will have great fortune. <laughs> I'm betting there's a very talented person Kojima hired who's like, No. And you can't forget about fa- oh. <sighs> 
fat man. Not every idea is a winner. Fun fight, though. But you know what? That doesn't make it stupid or dumb. It's just a little more uh, Kino than you'd expect coming off one. Based Kinography. Boss fights are few and mostly fun, but rarely highlight mechanics or test the player meaningfully. Vamp's fight is the only mechanically memorable battle because you're forced to use many kinds of weapons, and that's about it. Generally, fights were reserved for story beats, and that's fine. So how is the story? <laughs> Mr. President, that action is felonious in over 30 states. Well, at least one issue from the first game carries over. The characters relentlessly berate you with extremely lengthy codec calls. Huge swaths of potential gameplay time is sucked into the vacuum of exposition, and it's particularly baffling because even if the info were interesting or engaging, and that's a big if, it takes away so aggressively from the gameplay, it defies common sense. MGS2 is a video game, allegedly. It delivers its story even worse in the early and middle segments than whatever the first game was doing. But at least it's got the pee pee time. I'm not interested in spoiling these games thoroughly, you'd need an hour per. But one thing the first game did well was maintain its genetics slash fate through line and incorporated the resulting ideological conflict between Snake and his brother into the gameplay. MGS2, likewise, features a lot of new characters that are wholly too familiar, fill too many of the same roles, and just like the intro scene, the initial fear was, well, are you just copy-pasting the work? Just changing up the homework, guys? But that's the point. The entire game retells an old story with the spice of novelty and draws new conclusions via new threads. It uses the naive and unsure Raiden to tell a story about autonomy, which is admittedly close to the original conceit about fate, but free will in one's place in the world, especially a world devoid of normalcy, devoid of individual control, is interesting and engaging, especially in the final segment when the pieces fit together. You two, please don't flag this video! All I'm saying is, for video game storytelling, it's pretty damn good and I don't want to ruin it. If nothing else, Kojima and his co-writer's writing is eerily prescient. After peen spinning for at least five minutes, you're thrust into the end game, where a couple important things happen. You wander around dripless. By the way, do you think Raiden's nips could cut through diamonds? You link up with Snake and he gives you a sword. Oh, don't give him that. Now look what you did. You get a bunch of creepy calls. I'm pregnant, John. I appreciate Metal Gear Solid's commitment to the uncomfortable, even mild horror. A lot of stuff in the original game was meant to freak you out, and 2 takes it to another level. Less physicality in it, sure, but taking away the player's guidance, only being able to rely on Snake, the real version of the ideal self, is so much more intelligent and compelling than so many other story moments in games, at least in how it ties in themes to holistic gameplay experiences. That said, because I haven't got many other critiques, one contentious seed that takes root here is the series of obsession with itself. And I'm referring to its self-referential nature, right? A cyborg ninja, just like Grey Fox, aiding the protag and, spoilers, the entire thing being an effective recreation of the Shadow Moses incident, aka the last game. It's an interesting direction to take the story, an interesting meta-commentary on the nature and necessity of sequels, but it has the potential to trap Metal Gear in an Ouroboros of self-flagellation, which is interesting in that the series loves to reinvent itself. It's giving me echoes of Bioshock Infinite and other stories that exist as contained but rearranged parts repeated over generations in different contexts, but fundamentally are the same stories. The sort of coincidences that we understand as for the sake of maintaining the series' image, but necessitate questions, mostly why, and that particular criticism is relevant given the threequel. By the time I played 2, I was a fan. By the time I played 3, I knew I found something I could never forget. It's time to honor this incredible series, and I think I know how. Snake Eater. Not this one that shifts with the bad camera. All the others. I'm pretty sure this game's a hard 10 out of 10, and if I enjoyed control systems and pacing like this a little more, it'd be in my top 10? play this game? MGS3, the real good one, is at first glance a near total departure from its predecessors. You're in a Russian jungle. I will not dignify that any further. It's slow paced, it's got clunky menus instead of the sleek on-screen item display, it's got so many tricks and paths and techniques, so many banger elements under the coat, things looking like Fat Man. Ready to f <laughs> pop. Fans have another main protagonist to control. Ride in. Nah, I'm kidding, it's Snake. 
<laughs> nah, I'm kidding. It's the snake who would become the boss, who would become the big boss, which is a bigger boss than the original boss, you understand. Real sidebar, because I've ignored it. Solid Snake from the first two games is the genetic clone of Big Boss, a legendary soldier whose prequel story is told in this entry. Snake Eater departs from tradition in many ways, but retains the conceptual trappings of the original. A main character named Snake, a support team on speed tune. It's a radio now. There's a romantic interest. Piss time again! A mentor that betrays you. A series of goofy idiots with magic powers ranging from lightning to bees to photosynthesis! And all this is very interesting considering the lineage, yeah? In the first game, it's like, okay, Psycho Mantis is pushing boundaries here, phasing through walls. There's a cyborg ninja. And two ramps all that up considerably. But we accept it because the entire game is meant to recapture the original experience of Shadow Moses and play with the player's perception of reality. MGS3 goes straight magic realism. <laughs> it's packed with little historical accuracies and verisimilitude. A lot of detail work was done to ensure MGS3 felt like a semi-realistic Cold War black op. But this dude's packing bees. Snake doesn't care. Snake doesn't worry about photosynthesis. Snake doesn't even wonder why Russia suddenly has jungles for no reason. It's fantastical by design. These elements are presented as understood or acceptable at a glance. That's why I love it. Magic realism gets no credit. It's one of them fancy new school writing obsessions, at least it was when I was in writing class, but it's so freeing. I don't have to ask for some overfluffed 10 minute exposition on the enemy squad and their powers. They're just some mamma mia guys, FUA valid guys, you dig? Oh, anachrony too? Kojima, you filthy boy. <laughs> <laughs> From this entry onward, Metal Gear begins to reinvent its systems. This particular game synthesizes the old with good new ideas and some iffy ones. MGS was best when the player was intimate with the environment and their many available tools to perform freeform stealth gameplay. Now you know you're getting into serious tech implementation in highly detailed environments when you load into one of these games and Snake Eater drops the player into a lush, serene, often claustrophobic jungle where enemy vision cones are maxed but the player's ability to hide and play in sight amidst the flora and fauna is significantly buffed. The major gameplay addition is camouflage. It's never really glamorous to reapply in new environments, but it's definitely a new experience in stealth gaming. And mercifully, blackface provides no mechanical benefit. Except in this boss fight. Ruh -ruh! It's a slow paced, nerve wracking, but simultaneously empowering experience. You become the hunter, and the game could not care less about how you deal with problems. Goodbye. Like, look at my channel for two seconds. Sometimes I'm a little impatient. MGS3 says, go ghost, go trank gun, go throw dirty mags at people, lure them with food, just run and gun. Or my absolute favorite, give them a little poke. One shots almost everyone. It's incredible. I don't have room to list off examples of the sheer depth of mechanical brilliance this game encapsulates, but you have so much freedom and control of any given situation. So much room to play around. It dwarfs anything the other games tried, and even if it's best to just take every guard out at range with a silenced weapon or whatever else, there is no single method that's required. You might scrape by with a trank gun and knife on playthrough one, but you've got CQC to learn. You've got so many other weapons. It's worth noting that the controls feel deliberately less sharp, melee hits are stubby and slow, many animations are gummed up with recovery frames, everything feels deliberate. <laughs> oh, can you really die from that? <laughs> and really, between your stamina gauge begging you to forage constantly, every action affecting the gauge, every move affecting play, the narrative of survival is holistically twined with the mechanics. But normal mode isn't soul crushing, it's tweaked to keep the beginner always engaging with the systems instead of struggling to keep up. I love games that just let you play them and invite you back in with possibilities. It's my first choice among all Metal Gear games to revisit. Also, I get that the survivalist thing necessitates this menu the first aid screen, and I think it would have worked better if you weren't constantly taken out of the action to apply the same formulaic solutions to various wounds. You end up just slamming medical supplies into your skin unordered in the middle of boss battles. It's kind of sad. But like I always say, gameplay alone does not a great game make. What else is going on? I guess, even for a Metal Gear game, there's this obscene amount of personality on display, and it's kind of hard to explain. Kind of feels like the screen's electrified anytime two characters are sharing camera space, because after the first two games, I I know what's coming
speaking broadly, this game is about Big Boss. It's gotta end with Snake here becoming the boss. So it's not rug sweeping, it's just pure tension. And I mean every scene. Is the girl gonna double cross Snake? Is Snake's cover gonna get blown in enemy territory? That's Revolver Ocelot. What's he gonna do? There's no way that exists. I'm clearly splanked right now. And I swear that one bullet three revolvers scene is the scariest thing I've had to sit through in games. People think Kojima piss is a meme. You'd do that too if this psycho was juggling guns in your face, clicking like that. And all that character is put to use in a series of similarly terrifying boss fights, at least on first play. Ocelots is the early gun duel and doesn't say much, but it's a well-storied tradition of the series and we respect it. The pain may be among the worst, but at least it's got camp and survival elements You've got to use the environment and eventually the first aid screen if you get stuck with a hornet. Fair enough. The fear, without the thermal goggles, is terrifying. Shame they're in the game because you plant yourself and take aim for the whole fight when you've got them, and without, it's a proper gorilla trap fiesta. The end is just incredible. A sniper duel to the death that can take nearly an hour if you're unsure of what you're doing. Everyone's already talked it up to death, but like other fights, it utilizes survival elements, and uniquely, it asks the player to demonstrate mastery of stealth. It might sound crazy, but for an experimental fight, much like Psycho Mantis, the team included two ways to avoid the fight entirely. By quickly sniping him earlier in the game during a passing opportunity, or by, and I cannot make this up, fast forwarding the in-game clock so he dies of old age. Like, if you don't respect Metal Gear for that kind of stuff, get out of my goddamn video. The Fury is actually scary, an increasingly frantic fight reminiscent of Vulcan Raven, but you can use your firearms and make use of stealth options again. The Sorrow is one of those transcendent, eerie Metal Gear battles. He's got no health, Snake's apparently on the verge of death because his team can't communicate with him, and you're attacked by every enemy you've killed during your mission. Well, for me, that was just about everybody. Why did I kill them all? I made this so much harder! Thankfully, you can drown yourself at the start and take a revival pill to end the fight. The ending segment with Vol'jin and the Shagahod is very much the end of Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, you can use your guns on the blonde jackass, but you're gonna have to do some drive-and-shoot business. You're gonna have to rocket a robot to death. But Snake Eater isn't content with an ending that already happened. Metal Gear is evolving. Kojima probably thought Metal Gear was finished here, and they really went all out with the final segment. Cautiously leading a wounded Ava through the jungle while the guards pursue you. Reminds me of the Emma escort in MGS2 in that one really tense room with encroaching guards, but it comes to a head with the boss, Snake's mentor and traitor to America, without the context anyway. So I haven't given her the time because Oingo Boingo's spoilery hour, but the boss dismantles Snake, not just his gun, multiple times throughout the game, and lets him live each time. They've got a connection as mentor and student. It's a very motherly relationship. You know, she kicks everybody's asses all of the time, but she's never shrill or shrieking, she's level and soft. Gives her arm a three-point fracture. <laughs> the boss fight is memorable, if only because, uh, unless you've been doing some studying, mastering your CQC, you're in for a tough fight. She blends in, she's fast and doesn't flinch much. Thankfully, this game respects my need to play it on my terms. <laughs> That's three games and a pedigree of excellence. Very few series catch that vital lightning in a bottle, and fewer manage to harness it, develop it over many entries. Metal Gear took a complicated path. It grew more detailed and more mechanically complex while building on a simple but bold narrative base successively. It never stopped wowing audiences. But these days, Metal Gear is a lot more contentious. It's old news now, but the story is in the telling, right? Hey, it's K-Bash. Special thanks goes out to my $4 patrons, whose names are on the screen. The show's on its way somewhere good thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes out to my extra generous patrons, who are... Alexa! Andy Blarg! Arch! Basement Dweller! Boha! Brios! Cal! Can I cuss on here? Caesar T! Cordant! Chris A. Christo009. Cody Golden. Corgi the Lad. Couch Moba. CW Glassworks. Kyle Lapreed. Daddy Dagoth. Dakota Storm Jones. Dondium. Danky Stank Swanky Make. Dara. David Castillo. Den Het. Desdemona. Dylan Coffey. 8 Bit Funk. LPO. Elsa, Annex, Aesthetico, Exa, Frankenstitch, Glyph Seeker, Guard Cory, Gucci Plant, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, 
Harkage. Heman Damon Station. Huey. Ingenious Clown. I punched a sandwich. Irradiated cherries. Ice Kyle. Ivy Ruth Langley. Jason Lasky. Jaden. Jadis. John Weber. Joke Frog. Keegan Too Cool. Clocked. Crayden. Crazy Dark Chocolate. Latrix. Laundry Mom. Lego Sid. Loki. Lawn. Lucas Boyd. Magical Madman. Markules. Maximilian Wolfgang Niver. Mike DeVR. Milky Moo Official. Michelanius. Mr. Dodongo. Nairino. Nito Torpedo. Old Burgle. Old Man Cranberry. Only LK. Gaplant. PK Gaming. Quasar McDougal. Quillworth. Quinn. Reasonable Willow. Reggie Rodriguez. Ricochet Frame. Sagit Trash. Siren Smells Good. Salty Smasher. Sam Vertigo. Sekai Noah Warida. Shod. Silver Bear 909. Simp God. Sleepy Wabbit. Space Lizard. Special Children. Spooky Grimalkin. Squishward. Sublime Cataclysm. Super Katsanova. Super Sandwich Guy. TFY Lex. The Big Bubby. The Salt Knight. Thrips Heartrop. Travis Edwards. Twiddle Chungus. V01156. Vid. Venom. Vice Pup. Viewers Like You. Vic. Walter Taggart. Waposa. Weeb Trash. Well, shit. Zanny Tanner. Yay, Kundo! Zachary Livesey. Zachary V. Zanasso. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. Zed Slayer Gamer. Cyberbunk. If you'd like to help support the show and make it even better, check out my Patreon. We've got all kinds of goals and lots of rewards in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.